Today on Art Scene we'll feature one of Denver's hidden gems, the American Museum of Western Art, the Art Students League of Denver's Summer Art Market, and a public art dance performance, White Mirror. Amid the skyscrapers of Denver sit some amazing pieces of architecture and history. There's the Brown Palace Hotel, and across the street, the Navarre Building, which houses the American Museum of Western Art. Hi, I'm Bobby Lefebvre, and welcome to Art Scene. Inside this building, there's an amazing treasure of art, and we're going to let you in on the secret. Let's take a look. Kristen. Hi, yes. Hi, how are hey, you? Hey, good. How are you? Good, good. Nice good. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Where are we? We are at the American Museum of Western Art, the Anschutz Collection, and we are in the Victorian era parlor. Okay. Yeah. So. It's beautiful in here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah I think so too. <laughs> what year was this beautiful building created? So we uh, were built in 1880 as a girls' school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so 1880, 1880 to 2017, what mm -hmm. different iterations has this building gone under? Um, a lot. So it's changed hands many times over the years. Um, so in 1880, it was the Brinker Collegiate Institute for Girls. Um, and then it fell into the hands of a couple of known gamblers about 10 years after that. Interesting. And so they uh, turned it into what became a bordello. Okay. So a different type of educational facility. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after that point, um, it became an Italian restaurant. Um, it became a jazz club in the 1960s. Peanuts Hucko played here, okay. um, owned the building, and um, he was a guy that played with um, guys like Benny Goodman. Um, and so, kind of a famous jazz musician. So um, a lot of history. Lots of history. There's here. a lot of history in this mm -hmm. area of downtown. You know, there across is. the Brown Palace is across the street. Yeah. Any connection between this building and the Brown Palace? There is. Yes. Um, little known fact: um, the tunnel actually. So there's a tunnel that runs in between the two buildings, and it connects. Um, Originally, it was to connect coal carts so the buildings could be heated. Okay. Um, but, you know, I think uh, once this building became a bordello, it was a really discreet way for the gentlemen uh, over see. at the Brown Palace to make their way over to here. And so we've heard stories. Wow. Um, I mean, if these walls could talk, they I'm would tell sure. us more. But, so many stories. Mm -hmm. And now there's a museum here. There is, yeah. But how is sure. the museum structured? So okay. we've got um, a salon style um, interior. So that means artwork hanging from wall to wall, floor to ceiling. Um, on all three floors of galleries. Wow. Yeah. So well, it's um, a beautiful space. I'm really excited to see more of it. Um, and this yeah. way is the first gallery, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, right through here. Let's check it out. All right, let's go. This is our gallery space. And we've got um, a ton of paintings on the wall, but I wanted to show you this one here. Um, since it's one of the earlier paintings in the collection um, by an artist named William Tiley Ranney. And it's titled The Last Shot, painted in about 1850. And he's depicted this uh, lone trapper, mountain man, um, out there in the boundary waters. Um, he's looking over his shoulder, spinning around, and you can see that he's been spotted. Mm -hmm. um, there's Native Americans up on the hill behind him there, and you can see them on the horizon line. Um, and so this kind of just epitomizes um, what it might have felt like to be out there all by yourself trapping for furs in the mountains. Um, you know, you're all alone, all you have is your horse, and then here he is, it's titled The Last Shot. Right. Um, what does that mean? So, sure. you know, you're kind of left uh, with this curiosity and wondering what's gonna happen next. Very cool. All right, so um, we're gonna walk down this way and I wanna show you a landscape by Thomas Moran. Okay. Um, so he was an early artist that came out west as well and um, decided that he was going to show the landscapes of the West. Um, it was really hard for people to get out West. Mm -hmm. and the railroads weren't connecting East and West yet. Um, and so when he painted this one in 1866, 1867, mm -hmm. um, he hadn't even really made it out West himself. Um, and he's going off of stories about the West. So yeah, so the stories were inspiring artists and they're inspiring people to travel west, um, but really they're kind of just exploring things for That's the That's really, time. really interesting. So yeah. he had never seen this, heard about it, right. maybe read about it, mm -hmm. and then yeah. I guess that's what artists do, right? We're right, yeah, so he, he had heard so many stories about the west and he was really familiar with you know, the landscapes back east. 
And so he was using this kind of inspiration to come up with this made up, you know, imaginary scene. Wow. Uh, so it's really romantic and beautiful. The clouds are coming in after a storm. Um, but, um, you know, this was a really successful painting for him because he was able to put it up for collateral for a loan that paid his very first trip to the West. Really? So, yeah, so he got $500 um, loaned for this painting and was able to make it to Yellowstone for the first time. That's really, really mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and so those paintings that he did of Yellowstone um, were what helped Congress, um, persuade Congress to um, set that land aside as the first national park. Absolutely. Too. Yeah, so this painting is really pretty special. Yeah, when they tell you that mm -hmm. art isn't important, that's a great story. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> yeah, so this place is full of great stories. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of the best storytellers are Frederick Remington and Charles Russell. So they're hanging right next to us here. Oh, okay. And I wanted to show you these. Um, and we'll look at Remington first. And so he's right here, this beautiful um, sort of yellowy sunlit landscape. Um, with this cowboy in the foreground and he's mm -hmm. riding the bucking bronco and trying to tame the bronco um, Really what Remington is saying he's trying to tame the West. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, so the the West um, like we saw in the Rani painting earlier, right? This lone trapper out there all by himself. Mm -hmm. The West is a place of adventure um, And certainly Remington captures that with this cowboy here. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great There's a lot of movement. I mean even mm -hmm. in the there you could see the dust kicking up here. Yep. It's just it's yeah. a very strong strong piece, right? Yeah, this is called um, a cold morning on the rain a cold morning on the range. Yeah, and you can kind of feel that, that cool, crisp air mm -hmm. um, with that sun kind of coming down. Um, and I love how the cowboy is kind of almost framed by the mountain range in the back. Yeah. And the cowboy's arms are echoing the shape of the horse. And so just um, all that sense of action sure, sure. is captured. His hat sort of falling off it and, is, and, and yeah. tilting there and uh -huh. kind of matching with the mountains too. It's kind of yeah, neat. Yeah, yeah. It's a really cool painting. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that was done in about 1904. And um, Charlie Russell was another cowboy artist that was painting um, around the same time. So the one actually hanging right next to it here mm -hmm. um, is called The Scouts. And that was done in 1902. Um, so just a couple years apart. And these artists are known as cowboy artists, or we like to call them the interpreters of the West here because they interpret a West um, that has already even changed when they were painting. Sure. Um, and these were works that were reproduced in magazines or in journals and um, gave people a sense of what the West was like um, and the various encounters that you would have. And so here, um, Charles Russell has given us um, a group of Plains Indians um, kind of scouting um, their territory. And so it's certainly romanticized an ideal um, sort of landscape. He's got you know the sun shining on the pink mountainsides, mm -hmm. and it looks maybe like it's sunrise, you know. And, and this um, guy is kind of pointing out into the distance, and it just makes you feel like you could be there. Sure. Um, and Charles Russell was an artist that was there. Um, he was a cowboy cattle rustler, and um, you know he kind of lived that lifestyle. Yeah. And so. Um, he gives us a sense of um, the action that um, you would have felt. Yeah, absolutely. Out you can see, like you this. can almost see the wind blowing too. The the mm -hmm. you know the um, the plants here are sort of tilted. You could see mm -hmm. the feathers and the headdresses yep. sort of moving in the wind. Mm -hmm. um, what, a, what a really cool way to tell this narrative. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a it's a cool story. Yeah, let's take a look this way and just kind of see the rest of our space. We're gonna head upstairs okay. and check out the rest of the gallery space. So third floor. Third floor, All here right. we go. Come on through, third floor uh, Victorian era parlor here. And we've got more paintings um, just around the bend. Here. So you can follow me this way. All right. Yeah. So let's take a look down this way. Uh, we're in um, kind of our southwest galleries. So we've got um, a large group of paintings from the Tau Society of Artists and we're standing in an area here with four paintings by Ernest Blumenschein. And so he's right here in front of us. And he was an artist um, that was one of the founding group of artists that um, decided they were going to band together and market their work. Um, they were looking for um, subject matter that was really um, American, mm -hmm. um, especially because they were painting just around World War I. Um, they really wanted to find something that felt truly American in their subject matter. Sure. Um, and Taos really spoke to them. So not only um, because of the beautiful landscape that you can see in this example, but also um, interesting people that they encountered, um, really interesting architecture, um, Pueblo and architecture 
architecture. Yeah. Um, and so they um, decided that this would be the subject matter for them. And so they grouped together and would have these shows and um, painted um, a large amount of paintings. Wow. Yeah. Now this is this is beautiful. Yeah. So this is um, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, mm -hmm. and you've got the Pueblo village here in the snow scene down below, and then you see a penitente scene happening in the foreground mm -hmm. um, with these little brushes, you know, kind of around um, the foreground. These um, they're almost Art Nouveau in the way that sure. he's shaped um, those plants down there. Kind of sticking up through the snow. My grandfather was one of those superintendents. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I've got family from the San Luis Valley, so this, uh, the, the mountains here. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So they kind of look like that when you're, you know, especially with the sun shining on them and with the shadows, it's um, rhythmic mm -hmm. almost in the way that he's painted it. So it's, you know, dark, light, dark, light. Yeah. Um, and that you can kind of see that rhythm then echoed in the action of Penitentes down below. Yeah, it's um, beautiful. But as we've come up on this floor, we're getting increasingly modern. Right, so you see that he's a little bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. um, Puebloan architecture really does lend itself to cubism anyway, because yeah. they're square or cubed buildings. Um, but you can see that he's playing with that um, really extreme light and then the dark side by side. And then um, I also noticed that some of the, the people don't eat because their faces are... Exactly, yeah, they're faceless their faces. almost. Right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. neat. Yeah, so um, they become a little more simplified in their forms um, and um, really... Um, these, the little plants that I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. um, those are kind of Art Nouveau. So he's like bringing in these new modernist styles, right? So he's playing a little bit with cubism, um, he's abstracting in the buildings, and then um, these like really linear, curvilinear sure. shapes in those plants. Yeah. Um, so he's playing with his artistic style. That's neat, it's a neat mm -hmm. mix of uh, yeah. styles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this was done probably around 1925. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we've got other modernist paintings um, on this floor as well, works by Georgia O'Keeffe and John Marin um, and other illustrators, uh, well-known modernist kind of illustrators as mm -hmm. well, like Maynard Dixon. Um, and we've got a painting by N.C. Wyeth. How well. did you obtain these works? Um, so these were all part of the Anschutz Collection of Western American paintings, um, and they were gifted to the museum, which is a 501c3. Wow. Um, and so the building that we're in and all the paintings are all um, a part of um, the museum now, the American Museum of Western Art. And so we're open to the public, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, and then we reserve Tuesdays and Thursdays for school groups. Um, oh, so we love to have field trips in here. Very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll show you a couple other paintings um, upstairs. Yeah, yeah, let's go. So let's set it up that way. We'll be back with more of the American Museum of Western Art later in the show. Much more art scene coming up on the other side, including the Art Students League of Denver's Summer Art Market and White Mirror. And we're back on Art Scene. Every year, the Art Students League of Denver hosts an incredible summer art market with more than 250 artists. What's unique about the summer art market is that so many of the artists are your neighbors and friends and family, so you have an opportunity to meet and interact with all of the artists in their booths and talk to them about what their creative muses are, what their inspiration is, and really understand what's behind the work that they're selling. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of blown away by how many artists are out here today. Beautiful art and uh, great weather as well. Um, I've never come to this before. Have you been here before? I have been here before. It's bigger. I like that it's uh, expanded, kind of like everything else in Denver, so it's kind of getting bigger and a lot more uh, variation in artistic styles, not everything's just canvas and stuff like that, so I yeah. like that, yeah. It's definitely 
definitely very cool. Very cool use of colors for right now, too. Um, a lot of warm colors, bright colors. But it also um, makes it harder to pick. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I've like seen so like five much. or six pieces that I would for yeah. sure purchase. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Yeah. Oh, I, I love it every time I come. We have kids' activities taking place in our buildings. We also have artist demonstrations. There's great live entertainment during the festival. I just love seeing so many of our students and faculty out showing their work, and I love how many people come and get to learn about the Art Students League and interact with these amazing artists. It's really wonderful. We were just saying it's really cool to see so many different types of artwork, and um, it's our first time coming, so it's been, it's been a great day so far. Awesome. Now, for the first time ever, Denver Arts and Venues commissioned dance as public art. It's a piece commemorating the Holocaust, White Mirror. The performance was beautiful. Yes. Um, touch my heart. I love a park presentation, and that makes that you know, art and culture available to anyone regardless of their economic means. Now it's time to finish up our private tour of the American Museum of Western Art. And we'll end up over here by um, one of the most modern works in the collection. Wow. Um, by an artist named Kim Wiggins. Yeah, isn't that wild? Yeah. Uh, I love his use of color. It's so bright. Um, and his trees are almost like Dr. Seuss trees. Absolutely. They're just really cool and curvy. 
Um, and he's a really cool guy. So he's um, a living artist. He works out of Roswell, New Mexico. Okay. Um, and he actually is our guest speaker on our audio guide here as well. And so he kind of brings the artist's perspective um, from you know contemporary artists yeah. um, to talk a little bit about the history of Western art because Western art can be um, wild colors sure. and it can be you know neon orange like Absolutely. he's got here. Um, so this painting is called Merging of Cultures. Um, and it was done in 1997, and it's um, showing just the rich sort of assembly and um, you know melting pot of characters that we have, um, especially down in the Southwest. So and this piece is very different mm -hmm. than everything we've seen today. It it's, is, it's yeah, really, it's yeah. really vibrant. It's yeah, really it's cool. cool. So it's like you know uh, what Western art was, or what the West was, mm -hmm. and what it is now. You know, mm -hmm. so we've got. Um, cars, you know, bicycles. Sure. Um, we still have, you know, a church procession happening here. We've got mariachi band, we've got Native American um, rugs and artisans, and we've got um, a Santero as well. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody's kind of um, converging together in the Santa Fe Plaza here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really, really cool. I mean, when yeah. you go to, you know, New Mexico and places where mm -hmm. these things exist, this really mm -hmm. is representative of those you know town markets and squares where people congregate right. and hang out and mm -hmm. there's things happening yeah a lot of life here yeah it's exactly cool. yeah so this is a really lively painting and it um, it definitely shows you kind of um, just this great melting pot of, of cultures absolutely um, and so he's an artist that was inspired by Remington and Russell that we saw earlier mm -hmm. um, and there's um, you know he's part of a whole group of artists that really um, are still inspired by the West. Um, and moved to the West, right? So he grew up in the West, and the artist I was going to show you next mm -hmm. um, is actually an artist that didn't grow up here, but um, is really inspired by it. So I wanted to show you this one by an artist named Emil Bistrom, mm -hmm. um, who was actually Hungarian-born and um, wound his way to Taos, New Mexico, and fell in love with the space. So we've seen that before, right? Artists that are really drawn to, um, whether it's the landscape or the people or whatever the Southwest, it's like this magnet for artists. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, and so he's one of them and he experimented in this one with cubism. And so it's called Eagle Dance and you can see the feathers moving and you can see um, the dancer's legs moving and it's all um, in, within this kind of like circular motion. So it's, um, I don't know, it's a really cool painting. I really like it. Um, and he's an artist that not a lot of people know about, um, but he um, really changed kind of the face of Western art um, in that he was experimenting with all of these interesting styles. So That's what's really cool about this space is mm -hmm. as we walk through today, you told mm -hmm. me about, you know, the artist where they come from, what their influences were, and there's a, a diversity of, of artists that have uh -huh. contributed to this collection, which is really, yeah. really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got, um, you know, probably 180 artists represented wow. in this collection and um, 300 plus paintings hanging. Great. Um, and so, you know, this is just one of many, right, that we've seen, um, but we could take, you know, all day to talk about all of the ones that are here. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, that's wonderful. Back. I will. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, um, the other artist I wanted to show you is further down um, because we haven't really seen any women artists yet. That's true. Right? Um, so, we've seen, you know, great diversity, but um, let's get to our lady friend down let's the Check right it here. out. Yeah. yeah. So it's around the bend over here. Okay. Um, so these are kind of hung like thematically. Mm -hmm. So we've got landscapes again here to the left, and then we have some older works and California works here. So um, this one and the one next to it are by an artist named Grace Carpenter Hudson. She doesn't get a lot of attention. A lot of people don't even know who she is. Um, I think because she was a woman artist working around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. um, so here we've got portraits of Chief Roan and his wife. And um, Grace Carpenter Hudson was working in California for the majority of her career and was kind of immersed in Pomo culture and was friends with a lot of Pomo Indians. And so she would um, paint them and their children um, a lot. And then her husband was an anthropologist for Chicago's Field Museum and collected Pomo artifacts and would take photographs as well. They were invited um, by the Field Museum to go down to Oklahoma to the reservation and um, capture images and um, kind of get a sense of the lifestyle of the Pawnee as well. Oh, wow. And so these two paintings are from that trip. Mm -hmm. um, so these are um, a Pawnee chief and his wife, um, Chief Roan and yeah. his wife. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's it's a really really cool story. Uh, although it's also a little bit sad, right? You had right. this this person who was a very very talented artist who may not you know be as well recognized because mm -hmm. simply she was a woman, right? Right. And I think um, we can sort of make that same argument today that it's important mm -hmm. to continue to highlight women artists in this way. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think um, it's really special that this collection incorporates women artists, um, and and you know kind of tries to um, shed new light on what other artists were doing at the time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Alright, so we've got one final parlor here and... Um, They're all so cool and unique though. Yeah, aren't I, they I all neat? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A huge, uh, broad collection here. Absolutely. So, uh, glad you enjoyed it. No, thank yeah. you for showing us around. Mm -hmm. uh, I really think that this is a gem in our city that more people need to know about this. So mm -hmm. thank you for showing us the collection. Oh yeah, happy to. It was yeah. so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks so much to the American Museum of Western Art for having us. If you love Western art, or if we piqued your interest, also check out Denver Art Museum's The Western in Art and Film through September 10th, and History Colorado's Backstory, Western Art in Context through February 11th, 2018. Plus, the McNichols Civic Center building features two exhibits, Diversity in the Wild West, Buffalo Bill posters, and Diverse Voices of the Modern West, both through August 27th. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm Bobby Lefebvre. We'll see you next time as we discover more of Denver's art scene.